Hello YouTube. Uh, traditionally, philosophers haven't paid much attention to humour, uh, and this is perhaps quite odd given that humour has a central role in human life. Uh, indeed, it appears to be something that's unique to humanity, something that separates us from all other animals. Uh, so even for people interested in those big questions about human nature or whatever, it's worth thinking about humour. Uh, now, the central question for philosophy of humour is what is it for something to be humorous or amusing? What causes the feeling of humour within us? And broadly speaking, there are three theories of humour, the superiority theory, the relief theory, and the incongruity theory. And I should note that these theories are not necessarily in competition. Uh, we might think that uh, each theory identifies something important about humour, so uh, we can accept aspects of all of them. Um, Right, so the superiority theory was the standard theory of humour from uh, the ancient Greeks to the modern era. Uh, and according to this theory, humour involves perceiving your superiority to another person or being. You compare yourself to others and you find yourself to be better. Uh, this was famously defended by Thomas Hobbes, who described humour as a, a sudden glory arising in some conception of some eminency in ourselves by comparison with the infirmity of others or with our own formally. Um, so human life is highly competitive. When I see that I'm superior to others or that I'm uh, superior to my past self, so that I'm better now than I was in the past, this provokes a positive response. Humour. Um, you know, it makes a lot of sense that we would have a positive reaction to being higher in the, in the hierarchy, the social hierarchy, than other people. And the superiority theory certainly seems uh, to fit many obvious cases of humour. Just think of your favourite comedy shows. Uh, these almost always involve very flawed characters uh, or characters who frequently find themselves in bad situations. Think about what my, some of my favourite shows, Peep Show, Bottom, Red Dwarf, The Office. Uh, these feature characters who are stupid, cowardly, socially inept. Or think of a show like Friends. I mean, in, in that show, the characters are fairly normal, but they have frequent misfortune, um, like the uh, leather trousers scene, for example. A lot of the funniest scenes in the show come from uh, the misfortune of the characters. Furthermore, standard jokes uh, usually ridicule particular groups. So you have you know, blonde jokes, fat jokes, jokes that uh, play on stereotypes about nationalities. You know, um, uh, so, think about like the, the, the Irish jokes, for example. Uh, you know, an, an Irishman is pulled, pulled from a bar in blazers, covered in, in soot and ash. The firemen shake him awake. You know, what happened? How did the fire start? And the Irishman shrugs and says, well, it beats me, it was already on fire when I got here. So, you know, again, this is, um, we, we seem to be laughing at the Irishman here. Uh, many, many more politically incorrect jokes would seem to fit the superiority theory. And possibly the superiority theory uh, also helps to explain the appeal of comedians like um, uh, Neil Hamburger and Andy Kaufman and Stuart Lee. These are comedians who specialise in uh, anti-comedy, right? They, they very often don't really tell jokes. Instead, they perform these avant-garde routines that sometimes seem designed to just bore and annoy the audience. Um, I remember Andy Kaufman did uh, a routine that was literally just eight minutes of him eating ice cream. I think you can see that on YouTube if you type in Andy Kaufman eating ice cream. Nothing more to it than that. Stuart Lee has a routine where he pretends to eat poppadoms. Uh, it's, it's literally just him standing still, staring blankly ahead and making these quiet chewing noises for several minutes. There is nothing else to it. So why, would it, why on earth would anybody find that funny? I mean, it's a bit bit bizarre. Um, well, maybe it's because watching it, we know that the audience is becoming increasingly frustrated and we find amusement in their misfortune. I remember once taking my brother to, a, to hospital and as we were sitting in the waiting room, he'd, he'd had a, an accident come off his bike. Anyway, as we were sitting in the, in the waiting room, the hours passed and he got increasingly bored and annoyed. And I found his... Um, reaction quite amusing. Um, so may maybe um, there's a kind of superiority theory at work uh, in this kind of, of comedy as well.
However, there are several problems with the superiority theory. One of the most obvious problems is that perceiving your superiority to somebody else often leads to pity rather than humour. If you see a documentary about poverty in another country, you probably won't respond with laughter. So a big question here is, how does the superiority theory, you know, on, on the superiority theory, what is it that distinguishes humour from pity? I mean, presumably the superiority theorist would need to make the additional claim. Um, so they need to say humour involves perceiving yourself as superior, where the other person isn't so badly off that it provokes sympathy. If there is extreme misfortune, the sympathy blocks any amusement. And to be fair, this isn't... Uh, this isn't an ad hoc move because it's often the case that one emotion will override another. If somebody steals from you, you'll probably be angry. But then if you find out that they were desperately poor and their children were starving and they stole from you in order to feed their children, the sympathy would um, probably prevent any anger. So the idea then is that it, it, it works the same way with humour. Um, humour involves perceiving superiority, but if the other person has extreme misfortune, then uh, then we, we just end up feeling sympathetic instead. Perhaps a more serious problem um, is that we often seem to find humour in situations where there is no judgement of superiority. Some situations are just silly or absurd. Think of a lot of the surreal, absurdist humour of groups like Monty Python. And then there are also many jokes which involve wordplay and puns. So you know, a plateau is the highest form of flattery. Um, uh, I still remember what my granddad said before he kicked the bucket. How far do you think I can kick this bucket? It doesn't look like there's really any superiority, any judgment of superiority here. Um, these are just sort of silly and, and playful. Um, so, it, I mean, it, th these just seem to be completely outside the scope of any superiority theory. So uh, superiority can't be necessary for humour. There clearly seem to be cases where we experience humour without uh, any feeling of being superior. It's certainly true that uh, a lot of comedy seems to involve uh, flawed characters or characters experiencing misfortune, but it's worth asking, even in cases where we laugh at another's misfortune, does this involve a comparison to ourselves? When I laugh at uh, Ross's problem with the leather trousers, Am I making a judgement that I'm in a better situation? I think that's not at all clear. I mean, speaking for myself, um, when I watch TV shows, I very rarely think of myself at all. I just focus on the show. Uh, so there doesn't seem to be any comparison going on between uh, myself and the character. Of course, it might be argued that the comparison is a subconscious process, so that on some level I will be aware of the fact that this character is in a bad situation and I'm not in a bad situation, so maybe there's some sort of subconscious comparison going on, and this subconscious comparison leads to the feeling of humour. But I think even this is kind of strained when you consider that many people watch TV shows and films vicariously. In other words, they project themselves into the positions of the characters. They like to imagine that they are there with the characters. And this is why, uh, in so many, with so many comedy shows, we cringe along with the characters. We feel their embarrassment. Um, if you watch a, a programme like Peep Show, I mean, it's incredibly cringeworthy. It's sometimes the sort of thing that's actually difficult to watch. Um, so you don't engage with uh, comedies in this sort of purely detached way, where you can then kind of compare yourself with the characters and see that, oh yes, I'm better and that makes me feel good. More generally, the superiority theory struggles with self-deprecating humour. Uh, now, Hobbes did say that humour is found when you perceive yourself to be superior to others or to your own past self. But there also seem to be cases where we just poke fun at our current selves. When you find uh, a joke about your nationality or your social status or whatever humorous, because the stereotype seems to fit. Um, so one of the... Uh, kind of classic jokes about philosophy is that it goes something like, you know, the, the two cheapest two cheapest university departments are mathematics and philosophy. Mathematicians only need pencils, paper and a rubbish bin. Philosophers only need pencils and paper. I mean, even as a philosophy student, I can appreciate that joke. Uh, in fact, it might be worth mentioning that recently Robert Solomon proposed uh, an inferiority theory of humour. And on this theory, humour 
involves recognizing yourself as less than ideal, as flawed. Uh, it, it, so it requires the ability not to take yourself too seriously, basically. Um, I mean, that, that obviously would, would turn the superiority theory uh, completely upside down. Um, nevertheless, for all of the problems with the superiority theory, <coughs> it does seem to be true that humour often involves um, recognition of a, of a kind of hierarchy, right? It, it does seem to, uh, to, to play on uh, misfortune and... Uh, differences in, in social status and so on. So we might think, we might ask, you know, is this something intrinsic to humour? Is there something fundamental to humour that makes it so frequently emphasise power relationships? Uh, or maybe this is just a feature of the fact that hierarchies are a general feature of human life and so are naturally often found in humour. It's worth, um, worth considering that, but it, it, it does at least prima facie seem as though the superiority theory is onto something. Uh, an interesting related problem um, that is prompted by the superiority theory concerns the moral implications of humour. Uh, this is one of the big questions in philosophy of humour and I'm not really going to go into it much here, um, but you know, can jokes be morally wrong? And if jokes can be morally wrong, uh, can the fact that a joke is morally wrong contribute to its humour? So in other words, can a joke be funny because it's wrong? Different theories of humour have different implications for questions like these. Uh, if the superiority theory is correct, then it, it seems pretty plausible that, yeah, jokes can be morally wrong. And what's more, the moral wrongness is very often, in fact, maybe always part of what makes the joke funny, right? Jokes always assume the superiority of one group over another. So they always involve putting a particular group down. Um, so, you know, I mean, we, we wouldn't then, on this theory, we wouldn't be able to defend politically incorrect humour by saying, well, it's just a joke. If humour always involves judgments of superiority, then, um, you know, it, it arguably in, in undermines cooperation and tolerance, um, and uh, that would have some uh, moral implications. Many philosophers, uh, especially before the modern era, supported the superiority theory, and this led them to hold quite negative views of humour. Uh, in the ideal society described in Plato's Republic, the practice of comedy was highly restricted because it was felt that humour has a uh, degrading or corrupting effect on, on society. So it might be worth bearing in mind that, um, that yeah, these the different theories of humour uh, do appear to have um, moral implications. And on the superiority theory, humour seems to be kind of questionable. Um, a more positive view of humour was given by the relief theory, which became popular in the 18th century. The basic idea is that humour involves a release of pent-up mental energy, a uh, release of mental tension. Uh, so this theory draws on the connection between humour and laughter. Laughter is a bodily, emotional expression, and it's often difficult to control. So it's kind of analogous to crying in this respect. When, when negative emotions become extremely intense, and you can't hold them in anymore, you release through crying. Similarly, when fear becomes too intense, you might, uh, you might just run, you might flee. When anger becomes too intense, you attack. So the idea is there's a similar thing going on with laughter. Laughter is a fairly largely uncontrollable release of emotion. The difference is that it's a release of positive emotion um, and it, it doesn't uh, involve any motivation to action in the way that sadness, anger and fear do. So with those negative emotions we're motivated to get away from or to stop the negative stimulus. Um, but humour and laughter are a response to a positive stimulus that we don't need to, to stop, that we don't need to get away from. Um, it's it's just positive emotion kind of builds up <clears throat> and we release through through laughter. Now, <clears throat> a prominent defender of the relief theory was uh, Sigmund Freud. Uh, he suggested that different forms of humour release different tensions <coughs> created by the mind's attempt to inhibit particular impulses. We have all kinds of natural impulses, but our minds have a kind of internal sensor that suppresses them and ensures that we abide by social norms. Um, you know, I mean, so 
sex, for example, a lot of people are they have the impulse to just to just have sex. They might have the impulse to just have sex in the street, um, but you suppress that, right? And so it's this suppression of of these primitive impulses, I guess, that creates the tension. Humor is a means of bypassing the sensor and releasing the tension. For instance, the inhibition of sexual impulses leads us to enjoy sexual jokes. The inhibition of aggressive impulses leads to slapstick and comedy violence. Um, the inhibition of a tendency towards nonsense and childishness. So, so as we get older, we're expected to regulate our emotions and to behave rationally. Um, again, this inhibition of, of a tendency to nonsense creates a mental tension and that's released by surreal humour, like Monty Python. Uh, relief theory seems pretty well placed to account for humour about topics that are taboo. Um, we joke about all kinds of taboos in, in comedy. I mean, not everybody feels this way, but a common attitude is that you can joke about anything, right? There are at least contexts where no topic is off limits for humour. Um, I mean, certainly it seems like taboos are easier to break in a humorous context. Sometimes there's even an expectation that you will break a taboo. If you go to a a comedy show, you open yourself up to topics that wouldn't be discussed in polite society. We, a comedian can be politically incorrect or shocking or overtly sexual. He can joke about you know, the Holocaust and that's not usually frowned upon. It's, um, it's not morally problematic, contrary to the superiority theory. Instead, it's psychologically healthy um, because it, it releases these, these tensions. So politically incorrect humour, for example, it's not really about putting down minorities. Um, instead, it's releasing tensions by the way, uh, created by the way that we inhibit our worse impulses. I suppose those would be impulses to, uh, to, to tribalism or whatever. We inhibit those impulses and we are tolerant and respectful of everybody. But then in the context of humour, we uh, release the tensions with politically incorrect jokes. So uh, let's think about some problems for this theory. Um, well first, even when we find taboo topics humorous, more is required than just the taboo. So in some ways relief theory seems to sort of miss the point, right? Because the question is, well, I suppose the question is, what is it that causes the release of tension in some contexts but not others? We enjoy engaging with taboo topics in general not just in the context of humour. People might like reading about weird sex, sexual behaviour online, or they might like watching documentaries about it, and they don't find that funny. But why doesn't this release tension? Why, why, why doesn't this then provoke humour along the lines of the relief theory? It's, it, it's not clear um, what, what the difference... The relief theory doesn't really tell us what the difference is between a joke about bizarre sex acts and a serious documentary about about them. The primary objection to the relief theory is that it assumes an implausible psychological theory. In the past it was thought that nerves literally carried gases or fluids known as animal spirits that could uh, build up in pressure and that were then released in muscle movements. So in this context it was natural to suppose that we might sometimes need to uh, vent the excess pressure through actions like laughter. Of course, today we know that nerves carry electrochemical impulses and they don't literally increase in pressure. So we don't literally release anything. So the relief theory assumes what is at best a metaphor. Um, and we might be a little bit concerned uh, about, about that because it, it, the psychological theory behind the relief theory is, is just false. Um, and in fact, even on its own terms, right, let's assume that it's true. Right? Even if we assume that pressure does somehow build up in the nerves, it's not clear how this release is supposed to work. Right? Why exactly would telling a dirty joke release um, the, the tension caused by inhibiting sexual impulses? Why, why wouldn't it just increase your sexual impulses and so increase the tension? Or why wouldn't it have no appreciable effect on the tension? Um, I mean, after all, in general, thinking uh, merely sitting down and thinking doesn't take up much energy. If you want to release energy or literally burn calories, going for a run is much more efficient. So it's 
it, the relief theory is, is kind of missing a mechanism. Furthermore, um, the psychological theory of the relief theory makes various incorrect predictions. Uh, so for example, if it's true that jokes involve a release of tension, then we would expect that after a few jokes on the same theme, there's no longer anything to be anything left to be released, so you should stop finding them funny. But that doesn't seem to be true. A comedian might devote uh, a whole set to sexual topics, and if the comedian is good, you can you can keep laughing at the sexual jokes almost endlessly. It doesn't seem like the humour provoked by the jokes decreases over the set. Another example is that the uh, relief theory suggests that people with more inhibitions should find more things funny. Right? If you've got if you've got more inhibitions, there will be greater tension, and so there'll, there'll be kind of more to release, and and so you should find more things funny. Uh, those with greater sexual inhibitions should find sexual jokes more humorous because they'll have more sexual tension to release. But that just doesn't seem to be true. Um, I mean, I think it's actually pretty obvious that people who are sexually repressed are more likely to be offended by uh, by sexual, sexual jokes. They just won't find them funny. <clears throat> Third, uh, we noted that the relief theory is inspired by the seemingly tight connection between humour and laughter. This is actually a source of a lot of controversy. Laughter is prompted by many things that are not humorous. Being tickled, taking nitrous oxide, being surprised, um, or just copying other people in our surroundings. Uh, if other people laugh, we laugh with them. Sometimes we even laugh without any positive experience at all, uh, as with nervous laughter, when we laugh due to discomfort. Um, so, one point in response to this is that there is a distinction between what's known as uh, Duquesne laughter and non-Duquesne laughter. Uh, these, are f these forms of laughter involve very different physiological processes. So in Duquesne laughter, um, what's known as the orbicularis oculi muscle, which closes the eyelids, is contracted. And this muscle remains relaxed in non-Duquesne laughter. Only Duquesne laughter is associated with positive feelings. Non-Duquesne laughter occurs when you're nervous or when you're just acting. So the relief theorist might say, well, it's not so much that there's a connection between humour and laughter in general. There's a connection between humour and Duquesne laughter. Uh, again, even this is controversial because it seems like a lot of Duquesne laughter just happens in, in sort of positive social situations where we, uh, you know, we, other people laugh, we laugh with them. We might not really find anything humorous, it's just... Um, we're, we're feeling happy and, and the, the social situation is going well. Um, but that might uh, do something to answer this point. However, the other side to this problem is that we often find things funny without laughing. Uh, there's plenty of more mild humour that just gives us a sort of intellectual tickle without provoking any notable bodily response. And that's probably the case for most of the humorous things you encounter. Um, on, on just a day-to-day -day basis, we see a lot of mildly humorous things, um, but we don't laugh. Um, so in general, the relief theory doesn't seem to explain humour that um, only provokes mild emotions, right? It, 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 the relief theory only seems to work for the, the laugh-out-loud humour, the hilarious stuff. Um, it's just like the superiority theory, the, the relief theory will struggle with things like simple wordplay. The uh, you know a plateau is the highest form of, is the highest form of flattery. I mean you can see the humour in that, but you probably didn't laugh. I'm guessing. It doesn't seem very intuitive to say that you're releasing any tension when you're just mildly tickled by something. Okay, so um, in the next video we'll look at the incongruity theory, which is uh, the most popular theory of humour today. So um, that's all for now. Thanks for watching.